Hi, and welcome to the lecture on late modern English. So this is the second half of the early modern English uh, era. Um, I have an article here that um, I think is really relevant to the contents of uh, this video, but also like the upcoming uh, videos. What would English sound like 100 years from now? So I uh, highly recommend uh, reading this article if you have some spare time. And there are a couple of videos in there that you can actually listen to uh, to see what people predict English may sound like 100 years from now. So we started talking about the early modern English era, um, that's the 1500s to 1800s, and we also looked at a lot of the grammatical changes that happened um, to the English language during that period. The late modern English period, actually, um, it, it, it begins with the Augustan age uh, that is actually named after Augustus, who uh, ruled from 63 BC to AD 14. And the Augustan age actually starts after the restoration period, so 1660 to 1690, and it ends in the middle of the 18th century. So really, when we talk about 1500 to 1800, we're really talking about modern English, uh, and people really, uh, there's a lot of controversies about where early modern English period stops and the late modern English period stops. So we are kind of talking about the you know, beginning of 17th century um, at this point. So um, uh, there were a lot of names that I think most of you would be familiar with when we talk about the literature in the late modern English era. A lot of poets flourished, um, notable among them were Alexander Pope and Jonathan Swift. Um, and obviously Jonathan Swift is also known not just for being a poet, but he also wanted to fix the English language. I think he was really um, he, he really cared about the fact that English language, um, especially because it was being used by a lot more people because of trade and colonization, uh, was changing and he didn't like that. So here um, are two images of Jonathan Swift and Alexander Pope and as is very common from uh, photos and pictures of that era, uh, people always look like to the side and you know kind of uh, yeah Anyway, uh, so this is Jonathan Swift and Alexander Pope, and this is one of Jonathan Swift's essay that actually gained a lot of traction during that time. Um, and I will let you read it. Um, I'll let you pause the video and read it at your own leisure. But it, it's called A Proposal for Correcting, Improving, Ascertaining the English Tongue. Um, and so he was really, really a prescriptivist. And we'll come to prescriptivism in a minute. In this era, there, was, or there were also important prose writers such as Joseph Addison and Richard Steele, um, and they are also very well known for uh, being the first people to start periodicals, uh, The Tatler and The Spectator, um, and these two periodicals are associated uh, with Addison and Steele. So here's Joseph Addison, Richard Steele, um, and again, um, they, they're kind of not looking to the side, but they're looking, you know, um, and, and they look alike, really. But Okay, so in this era, in the early modern English, late modern English era, people were not sure about English as uh, the language of science because, well, obviously English was a peasant language in the Old English and the Middle English era, and then it started rising uh, during the Tudor dynasty. So people really thought that English was not a good language for, for science. People did not really like English as uh, the language that they wanted to write in, um, etc. So this is really where we start to see the birth of what is known as a prescriptivist tradition. Prescriptivism is really the idea that language should be pure and it should have a standard form and uh, people shouldn't change it or language shouldn't change because you know, it, it adds to the chaos uh, of language. And so Jonathan Swift was one of the eminent writers uh, who had this prescriptivist attitude. And obviously, present day linguistics is nothing but pres it's, it's far away from prescriptivism. Um, we don't subscribe to pres prescriptivism, and prescriptivism is something that I think still exists in very subtle formats in the way that English or language is taught in this country. Um, but it's, it's, it is not a good way of teaching language. 
one of the reasons why prescriptivist traditions came to being uh, was because there were a lot of grammar books that were written during this time. Uh, and you first, here's when you start to see even grammar books written by women and not just men. One of the grammar books, famous grammar books, was written by Ben Johnson, and this was the Grammatica Linguae Anglicane in, 19, uh, in 1653. Um, and again, in this grammar book, it was uh, a lot of guidelines for actually speaking English correctly, writing English correctly, pronunciation, and that kind of thing. The famous, uh, the other famous grammar book was written by Bishop Robert Lout. This was a short introduction to English grammar in 1762. And I don't know if you have maybe come across this book in any other applied studies classes or something, but it was quite influential for the way people actually thought about uh, elementary and secondary education um, in America. So uh, again, Lout's book was a series of do's and don'ts, right? So where do you use whom and where do you use who? And why don't we, we shouldn't end a sentence in a preposition. And um, if you remember from 315, um, I, I've talked about how a lot of these are linguistically incorrect uh, and maybe stylistically okay, but really, I mean, stylistic works for writing, but not for speaking. And when we talk about language, we often talk about language from the, the speech aspect of things. So take all of these with a pinch of salt, especially when you are in your classes, in, in your classrooms and teaching uh, and student teaching. Um, I, I'm sure you will find a lot of these in your textbooks as well, but you know, leave prescriptivism aside. Um, some other rules that Laut actually formulated was for the rule for the shall and the will. I'm sure many of you know this. Um, and, and, and so again, these are kind of prescriptive rules that again, uh, teachers pass on to their children. Children never understand why um, we shouldn't use this. I mean, you can cook up an answer, you can cook up a theory, but really children will only do what they want to do. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, teach grammar the way it should be taught from the linguistic point of view, not from the prescriptive point of view. So here is uh, Robert Louth and his grammar book, A Short Introduction to English Grammar with uh, Critical Notes. And obviously, uh, I mean, here are some more prescriptive um, attitudes towards grammar. Um, prescriptivists really don't like to split the infinitive. So uh, to angrily reply to a question, um, right? So you cannot say to reply angrily to, uh, sorry, to, uh, to reply angrily to a question um, is, is, is okay, but to angrily reply to a question is not okay because you're splitting the infinitive to reply. Indecisiveness about prepositions, so where do you use from, where do you use as, where do you use to and in, etc. And uh, the plural form, uh, the plural nouns, the use of less and fewer. So he has fewer books than she, rather than he has less books than she, right? So they don't like, they don't like users to interchange uh, these two. Uh, the demand for I is first person pronoun, so I came, but it is me, who's there, me right? Uh, because of the different positions, I in the subject position and me in the object position. So there's this distinction between a subject and object. Um, and often uh, use I uh, on occasions such as like between you and I, right? Not between you and me, um, right? So many uses of pronouns in this kind of respect was again, going back to the prescriptive tradition. One other thing that also came about, not just dictionaries that had a list of um, vocabulary items, but also pronouncing dictionaries, because obviously this was a time when people really cared about how you would pronounce certain words of English. And so there were a lot of pronouncing dictionaries and rhetorical grammar books that were popular. So Thomas Sheridan and John Walker were two grammarians who were really concerned about how to uh, pronounce the English language. And John Walker's uh, book actually was immensely popular. And um, it, a lot of, lot of different editions um, of this book have been published. So here is uh, Sheridan's rhetorical grammar book. This is a rhetorical grammar of the English language, uh, propriety of pronunciation and justness of delivery in that tongue by the organs of speech um, by Irishman, um, Thomas Sheridan. And here is uh, John Walker's Pronouncing Dictionary, a critical pronouncing dictionary and expositor of the English language. And um, I'll again let you pause your video on your own to read the rest of the uh, title. <laughs> 
here's a sample entry from uh, Walker's Dictionary to kind of like give you an idea of um, how they viewed prescriptivism, right? So the, the point in question is the pronunciation of D-U-K-E. Um, people say Duke, um, but some people say Duke and uh, Duke. Some people even say Duke. Um, and so the idea is that when, if you say Duke, uh, for example, according to uh, John Walker, it borders on vulgarity. Right, and the true found of the ooh must be carefully uh, preserved as a written duke. So, duke was a preferred pronunciation and not duke. And I know that the British English pronunciation and the American English pronunciation varies uh, for this word, uh, but this is the kind of prescriptive tradition that you actually see in England at that period. Um, because of pronouncing dictionaries and because people really played a huge, placed a huge emphasis on uh, pronunciation, elocution uh, was one of the things that came out. It's the art of successful public speaking, uh, something that I think the, the, the founding fathers brought to um, America as well um, is something that really came out um, um, of this period. Uh, and people obviously did not like anybody uh, who didn't have a standard English uh, at that point. So people criticized um, vernacular London uh, English, Dublin, Welsh or Scottish English because obviously it was a lot more inflected and was a, there was a different accent, etc. The distinction between the early modern English period and the late modern English period, uh, there isn't much of uh, pronunciation changes, there isn't much of grammar or syntactic changes, but vocabulary is what distinguishes the early modern English with, from the late modern English era. The two historical reasons for uh, the change in the vocabulary, one, the Industrial Revolution, the biggest change, uh, more like it, and the rise of the British Empire as a colonial superpower. The Industrial Revolution started in England and it changed the social structure, it changed the economy of England. It's a revolution because it changed the manner or it changed the way things were done. And although it, it happened over a period of time, it happened over like about 100 years, the year 1760 is generally considered as the eve of the Industrial Revolution or the year that the Industrial Revolution started. There were a lot of advances in techniques during this time. So you have new agricultural techniques and practices. So um, there was increased raw, raw materials, there were increased uh, food supply, et cetera. Uh, productivity increased, uh, commerce and uh, economy increased and uh, the market changed, et cetera. There was a lot of trade that happened. There were a lot of production. So uh, things like coal, water and steam. Um, this was obviously also the start of like the first steam engine, uh, for example, right? So emergence of new means of transportation, uh, et cetera. So a lot of these innovations that happened in the Industrial Revolution happened in Great Britain at that point. By 1800, by the time you get into the end of the uh, late modern English era, you start to see that Britain becomes the workshop of the world, right? So there's a lot of textile and mining industries that Britain was famous for at that point, and they also produced a large number of manufacturing goods. So here is a photo of steam powered looms. And as you can see, a lot of women working uh, in the factories at that point. So you can see there's textiles being produced, there's looms uh, being produced at the point, mass production of it. So a lot of things became cheap. A lot of things could be traded with other countries or given to other countries, given to the colonies of Britain, etc. Because of the Industrial Revolution and uh, because of the fact that Britain started colonizing a lot more, there were a lot of linguistic con uh, consequences. One, we needed new terminology to talk about all the new innovations that Britain uh, came up with. So uh, basically, this means that, well, Britain had to come up with new words, but also that the new countries that Britain were trading with or colonizing also have to uh, kind of pick up uh, these words and learn English. So they were propagating English. Uh, English was becoming almost, you know, we start to see that the beginning of the lingua franca era of English um, and also a lot of new technologies were on the rise at this point. At this point, there was no doubt, but scientific papers were written in uh, English. English did become the language of science and continues to be the language of science even today. The discovery of the new world continued the English language dominance. So you had inventions like electricity, telegraph, telegram, sewing machine, computer, etc. And these words originated as English words because 
English speaking countries produced these uh, new technologies. So what happened was to create all these new words, we call this a linguistic process of neologism, right? So you are creating something new, you're discovering something new. And to create a neologism, to create a new word, English obviously turned to classical languages such as Latin and Greek. And so basically you, you take a Latin or Greek root and you make it sound like English. So words like oxygen, nuclear, vaccine did not exist in the classical languages, but they were created from the Latin and Greek roots, uh, for example. So here are some words that were created during this period, uh, and um, as well as words like anything ending with ology, anything ending with onomy, etc., cetera, um, was created as late as 1800. You can start to see that these fields also start to come about as uh, departments in universities or fields of research uh, study uh, in around uh, this time. There were also new words coined for pr products and machines like train, engine, reservoir, combustion, hydraulic, lithograph, camera, etc. Um, and so in some cases, old words were given entirely new meanings like vacuum and cylinder and pump and locomotive, etc. And you can also create uh, and amalgamate um, new words. So compounding was a productive strategy at this point. So you can say railway, horsepower, typewriter, airplane, etc., where you have two existing words of English and then you fuse it together using compounding. The second factor, other than the Industrial Revolution, was uh, colonization. And British Empire really, in the Tudor dynasty and following that, uh, really gained momentum into um, traveling across the world and doing trade with other countries and colonizing uh, smaller nations. So at the end of the 16th century, uh, we had English speakers, mother tongue English speakers, which were five or seven million. And over the next 350 years, this increased to almost 50 fold. So 80% of them were living outside of Britain. And the reason was because of colonization. Right. So at the height of the British Empire, that's the late 19th and early 20th century, British ruled, Britain ruled almost one quarter of the Earth's surface. So here is a map of all the uh, kind of colonies uh, of Britain. So you can see that uh, Canada and uh, parts of eastern uh, US uh, were colonies of uh, the British Empire. Uh, you have some um, areas in uh, Latin America, uh, Honduras, etc. Britain, obviously, right there, then parts of Africa. Africa, um, India, um, parts of Arab countries, Burma, Australia, New Zealand, um, etc. So you can see that many parts of the world uh, were colonized by the British Empire, or as they say, the sun never sets on the British Empire. So what happened during colonization was that, well, a lot of words were borrowed from the languages that were spoken in the colonized countries and adopted into the English language. So from Australia, for example, native languages of Australia, you get words like boomerang and kangaroo, etc. From uh, Indian languages, you have pajamas, bungalow, jungle, shampoo, um, etc. And so what happened during the zero was we start to see the rise of new Englishes, right? So we start to see not a standard variety of English, but we start to see Englishes that are spoken in smaller kind of um, populations, right? Smaller communities that are spoken in these colonized kind of regions. And in 1789, Noah Webster um, predicted that the language of Northern America was going to be very different. So American English was going to be very different from uh, the standard variety of British uh, English or any other variety of English that existed at that point. All right, so I will see you uh, in the next video for the um, next video on linguistic changes in the late modern English era.